The DC Extended Universe has been in a state of disarray for the past few years. It feels like ever since the troubled release of Justice League in 2017, the franchise has failed to find any real direction or identity. Although there have been some notable successes in the past six years, Aquaman grossing over a billion dollars, and the likes of Peacemaker, Shazam, and The Suicide Squad all being very well received, it became clear to almost everyone that a new direction was necessary for the franchise. And then following the merger between Warner Brothers and Discovery, James Gunn and Peter Safran were announced as the new heads of DC Studios in November 2022. And alongside this news came the promise of a new 10-year plan and the beginning of an all-new DC cinematic universe. While we're still in the early stages of fully learning what Gunn and Safran's plans for DC are, the duo announced a slate of projects last December that will make up the first phase of this new interconnected series, collectively known as Gods and Monsters. And with anticipation for these projects growing with every passing month, I wanted to highlight some of the comic books that are seemingly serving as inspirations for these already announced DCU projects. So in this video, I want to discuss every upcoming DC film and TV series and the comics that have been talked about as being major influences, explain their history and significance, and what these books might tell us about the exciting future of the DC universe. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it, and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. Okay, so let's start with the big one. On July 11th, 2025, Superman Legacy is set to be released. Written and directed by James Gunn, this film will serve as our reintroduction to the Man of Tomorrow and be the formal beginning of the new DC Universe. When announcing the project, Gunn explained that the film is set to focus on Superman's journey to reconcile his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing as Clark Kent, and what it means to be the embodiment of truth, justice, and the American way in a world that sees kindness as old-fashioned. At the time of recording, we know that David Cornsweet, best known for his work on the Netflix shows Hollywood and The Politician, as well as starring as the projectionist in A24's Pearl, will step into the iconic red boots to play Superman, while Rachel Bosnahan, star of the acclaimed Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, will co-star as Lois Lane. Alongside this, an array of other heroes have been cast, including Hawkgirl, Metamorpho, Mr. Terrific, and Guy Gardner, played by longtime gun collaborator Nathan Fillion while Nicholas Holt looks set to star as the villainous Lex Luthor. During the development of Legacy, Gunn spoke extensively about his inspirations behind this story, primarily pointing towards two comics, Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly's All-Star Superman, and Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale's Superman for All Seasons. Now, for anyone familiar with this channel, you've likely heard me talk about All-Star Superman before. Not only is it one of my favourite comic books ever, but I think it's the perfect encapsulation of the themes and ideas at Superman's core. Released between 2005 and 2008 as a 12-issue limited series, All-Star is an out-of-continuity tale that chronicles Superman's final year on Earth, as the hero is diagnosed with solar radiation poisoning and given a year left to live. As Clark processes his morality, the comic showcases Superman's attempts to leave the world and those within it in a better place than he found it, whilst the people of Metropolis and beyond reckon with the realisation that even the invincible Superman is mortal. Although I adore All-Star, I'll be the first to admit it's a somewhat difficult comic to adapt. The book works best as the culmination of years of Superman stories, and even though it's not steeped in continuity, it does feature a lot of high-concept and fantastical elements that I'm not sure could be easily adapted onto the big screen. But even if I don't expect Superman's battle with Solaris to appear in Legacy's third act, I do expect a lot of All-Star's overarching themes to be incorporated into this upcoming film. Specifically, Morrison uses the setup of Superman's impending death as a way to analyse the character's impact on the world, both in a sense of how the people of the DC Universe are changed by Superman's presence, but also in a meta sense of how we, the readers of comics and the watchers of movies, have been shaped by his presence over the last 84 five years. 
It's a character study on a hero that some may find antiquated and old fashioned, but who also instills a sense of comfort inside so many. Even in the comics finale, when Superman is believed to be dead, we see Metropolis is left inspired, determined to become kinder, warmer and stronger, leading by their hero's example. Alongside this, All-Star Superman is a comic very much about fatherhood. The book was written following the passing of Morrison's real-life father, and the likes of Jor-El and Jonathan Kent play integral roles in its plot, as Superman reflects on losing his own fathers, and what legacy they left behind as he faces his own looming demise. Now, James Gunn has spoken openly about his father's passing in August 2019, and how reflecting on his dad inspired his take on the last son of Krypton. In March of 2023, he took to Twitter and stated, my brother Matt told me when he saw the release date, he started to cry. I asked him why. He said, dude, it's dad's birthday. I hadn't realized. I lost my dad almost three years ago. He was my best friend. He didn't understand me as a kid, but he supported my love of comics and my love of film, and I wouldn't be making this movie now without him. I was offered Superman years ago. I initially said no because I didn't have a way in that felt unique and fun and emotional that gave Superman the dignity he deserved. Then a bit less than a year ago, I saw a way in, in many ways centering around Superman's heritage, how both his aristocratic Kryptonian parents and his Kansas farmer parents inform who he is and the choices he makes. So I chose to finally take on writing the script. From this, it's clear that All-Star's commentary on memory, fatherhood, and the impact of Superman's heroics will be central to Gunn's upcoming film. Superman for All Seasons, the other comic noted as being a major influence, deals with a lot of these ideas as well. Released as a four-part series in 1998, this book celebrates Superman from the perspective of four characters closely associated with him, Jonathan Kent, Lois Lane, Lex Luthor and Lana Lang. Each of these four issues is told from the perspective of one of these characters and details how their relationship with both Superman the hero and Clark Kent the individual have impacted their lives for the better. From these two comics, I would expect Superman Legacy to be both introspective, somber and emotionally resonant, while also a very vibrant and fantastical film, and a celebration of Superman's more bombastic and larger than life elements. Given Gunn's ability to balance human emotion with often outlandish characters as seen in Guardians of the Galaxy and The Suicide Squad, I'm personally excited to see his take on DC's flagship superhero, and I firmly hope that Legacy is the perfect kickstart to this new era of storytelling. While I was in the process of writing this video, it was reported by Deadline that The Engineer, a founding member of the Wildstorm superhero team, The Authority, was set to appear in Superman Legacy. The Authority have long been rumoured to have some sort of presence in Gunn's upcoming film, before spinning off into their already announced solo project. So in the spirit of opening things up to a bigger universe, I've invited a few guests into this video to talk about certain books and characters that they're more qualified to discuss than me. And right now, allow me to hand the video over to Nando V Movies, who will explain who the Authority are, what we can expect from their eventual solo film, and what role they might serve in Superman Legacy, as well as in the wider DC Universe. Hey Owen, it's me Nando from Nando V Movies, and this year I made two videos fan casting the eight members of the Authority that I expect we will see in the James Gunn produced Warner Brothers new DCU version of the team. I want to talk about my big question about the Authority, and it's just why? Why is this apparently the second live action movie that they're going to be producing after Superman and before Batman? Like, why are we doing this team? This team was part of Wildstorms. This was not originally a DC Comics team. It was one of the uh, groups was folded in when they kind of merged those universes. And basically the story of the Authority is after the Justice League of that universe called Stormwatch got eaten by aliens, Jenny Sparks realized that there was a power vacuum. Jenny Sparks is the spirit of the 20th century. She has electricity powers and she is 100 years old. So Jenny Sparks says we got to do something. We need to form some sort of team. She does not have an OK from the government. She's not working for Henry Bendix, the kind of evil Nick Fury of this universe. She's doing her own thing. She gets some pushback from people that are like, you're not allowed to make a superhero team. And she's like, too bad, I'm doing it. She assembles a team of seven people, including herself. You got Jack Hawksmoor, the god of cities. This guy who's had his whole body replaced by aliens that are actually people from the future, turning him into this ultimate weapon of a man who gets super powerful around cities and can also control cities and turn him into a big kaiju. 
Then you've got the engineer and the doctor. The engineer is basically Iron Man and the doctor is basically Doctor Strange. But if he did drugs, you have Midnighter and Apollo, the Batman and Superman of that universe, who are gay and in a relationship at the time of this book. They've broken up and gotten back together. And then Swift, a bird person. Those are the seven members of the Authority. In this first run by Warren Ellis and Brian Hitch, which I would say is probably the best run this team is involved in, they fight a bunch of super terrorists, they get invaded by evil Italians from another universe, and they go kill God. That's like the kind of stuff you can expect from this book. I would say it's creative in the way that Warren Ellis can be pretty creative and just fun, like big ideas, and it sells itself as a more adult Justice League. I imagine we'll get the origin of this team, which is the first four issues of this run, which is the Gamorreans, a bunch of super terrorists start killing people, and the authority needs to be formed to fight them. I wonder why though again why is this second because functionally in universe what will be the difference between the authority and the justice league because i assume within at least a couple of movies we will have a justice league made up of superman batman the wonder woman or whatever amazon we get from that show one of the lanterns maybe both and then whatever other characters get introduced everybody but booster gold he can't be on the team but then like what is the what is the difference between them and the authority the justice league does not always have a mandate from the government they're just doing their own thing we as comic readers and the people in that universe trust superman and batman a lot so when superman and batman say we're going to get a big team together and we're going to go live in a satellite everybody goes okay so is the only difference between them doing that and the authority that jenny sparks is just not superman like she is a good guy and i think she's written as a character who you are supposed to mostly trust but she also smokes and swears and she's a badass in that like kind of early 2000s badass female character kind of way so is this team just kind of a proto justice league that forms doesn't work but gives superman and batman the idea to form a justice league like i assume we'll get at least one authority movie maybe if it's popular a second one i've heard rumors that they may show up in a future thing there may be some superman authority crossover that would make a lot of sense especially since the elite a group of villains from the superman story what's so funny about truth justice in the american way are authority pastiches so like it would make sense to just take the actual authority since they exist in the dc comics universe now and just have them fight Superman. One of the things I'm most excited for is that Matthew Vaughn is rumored to be working on this, I assume as a director, and Matthew Vaughn is really good at taking these edgy concepts, especially the ones from Mark Millar books, and turning them into something that's interesting and nuanced and fun. So I think he'd be a great director for something like this. I have lots of ideas of who should play who, and if you want more detailed character descriptions and my thoughts on the individual authority members, I have two videos about those, and I'm sure will be linked somewhere, either in the description or the end of the video or something. So definitely check those out. But yeah, my big question with the authority is why? Why second? Why before a Justice League? Are they supposed to exist to show Superman what the Justice League should not be? Or are they going to be like Suicide Squad? They're always going to be in the background doing their own thing. And characters like Superman and Batman will see them and go, whoa, we can't be them. We got to be better than them. Well, I do think these characters could be a hit. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get like two or three authority movies. I think they could do the run where they fight the Avengers. I think we could get Jenny Quantum, which is Jenny Sparks replacement. There's so many different angles they could take with this. And I guess part of it is I trust James Gunn. Like I just genuinely think he's a good writer and director and he has good instincts and he understands comics. So if he says the authority comes second in this universe, it must mean he has some cool, interesting idea for why. So that's the part about this book and this team that I'm the most excited for. I would never expect that they would ever make an authority movie, especially not one that's in continuity with the rest of these Batman and Superman movies. So if James Gunn's going to do that, that must mean he has a good reason. Although Superman Legacy and The Authority look to be the first two movies in this new DC slate, the first project set to be released will most likely be the animated series Creature Commandos, which is set to premiere sometime in 2024. This seven episode cartoon, written by Gunn and set to release on Max, features an ensemble cast of monsters and misfits assembled by Amanda Waller. Led by Rick Flagg Sr. voiced by Frank Grillo, this Black Ops team will include the likes of Frankenstein, Dr. Phosphorus, 
GI Robot and Nina Mazursky. Now, although this is a far more obscure property than Superman, there is still a fair amount that we can gauge about what this series will be like. The Creature Commandos first appeared in 1980's Weird War Tales issue 93, in a story written by legendary comic writer J.M.D. Mateus. Here, the team are assembled by Lieutenant Matthew Shreve and sent to France to battle Nazi-built duplicates of various world leaders. Interestingly though, the original Creature Commando stories from the 1980s do feature the ensemble travelling to Dinosaur Island, a location best known for its role in Darwin Cook's seminal comic book, The New Frontier. With the cartoon being described by Gunn as an aperitif to the overarching plot of the DCU, many have theorised that Dinosaur Island may play a role in the universe's bigger story, potentially leading to some version of The New Frontier being adapted at a later date. In regards to more recent comics though, I expect Jeff Lemire and Alberto Poncielli's 2011 series Frankenstein Agents of Shade to have a big influence on Creature Commandos. This book, published as part of DC's New 52 initiative, introduced a new team of commandos led by the titular monster. Orchestrated by the Superhuman Advanced Defense Executive, or Shade, Frankenstein serves as the field leader for a group of supernatural beings and metahumans, including vampire Vincent Velcoro, werewolf Warren Griffith, and revived mummy Kalise. I actually had the opportunity to sit down and speak with Lemire recently while attending Thought Bubble, and he discussed how this series came to be, stating that, I did a number of books at DC when the new 52 thing was launching, yeah. and Animal Man and Green Arrow are the ones people remember, but I feel like Frankenstein's like a hidden gem a little bit well, in my... That's how I felt, like obviously I read... I had a lot of fun I read it. Animal Man, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Morrison role. Yeah. So I'm always, like, there's another Animal Man series I read it, and obviously that's a tremendous series. Yes. And Frank, so Frankenstein kind of like, because it's such a weird book. Yeah, I mean, I, to give credit where it's due, I think I, I was really just riffing off things I love, so... Yeah. There's the original Jan D Dimitrius stuff, which is incredible. And then there's the Grant Morrison Frankenstein from Seven Soldiers. And he created Shade. He created that version of Frankenstein. I f absolutely fucking love that book. That Fra Doug Mankey and, and uh, the Grant Morrison Frankenstein. It was I just loved the book. And that was before I was working in comics as a fan. Just loved it. So when I had the chance to like take what Grant Morrison had done and then take what the original Creature Grant does and like mash them into something... It was just, honestly, I, it was just fun, and it was almost like fan fiction. It was yeah. just, you know, it was, it I had a blast doing it. Like, it was my homage to both these creators who I adore, yeah. Grant Morrison and, and JM, so, yeah. So just like, like, they're two of my all-time favorite writers, so like, just the thought of getting to play in the sandbox of like, their genius, yeah. must be so fun and so exciting. Yeah, and then you try to add your own personality and, your, and some new things to it as well, so that you've added, and you're not just repeating, but you're adding as it's well. Like taking it and passing it on yeah. to the next. Judging from the artwork released by Gunn late last year, I would anticipate that the show will draw a fair amount of inspiration from Lemire and Ponticelli's reimagining. The inclusion of Frankenstein, played by David Harbour, as well as his bride, suggests that these will be two of the main characters in the series. And I wouldn't be shocked if Gunn and his collaborators were able to blend the team dynamics of the modern comics with the missions often featured in the original 1980s Weird War Tales. A DC project that has long been in development is a TV series centred around the Green Lantern Corps. First announced back in 2020, Seth Graham Smith and Mark Guggenheim initially developed a show that would start a team of lanterns, including Guy Gardner, Jessica Cruz and Alan Scott. In early 2021, Finn Whitrock was cast as Gardner, while Jeremy Irvine joined the cast as Scott. However, after this, things didn't really seem to materialise, and by October 2022, it was reported that the show was being heavily retooled. Soon after, Gunn and Safran unveiled their plans for a series simply named Lanterns, which would star Jon Stewart and Hal Jordan as they uncover a terrifying mystery that would inform the larger story of the DCU. This show, pitched as being inspired by HBO's True Detective, was promoted using images from Gabriel Hardman and Karina Becko's Green Lantern Earth One series. Published as two volumes released in 2018 and 2020, Green Lantern Earth One offers a unique take on the cosmic side of DC's universe. Set in a distant future, it introduces Hal Jordan as a disillusioned astronaut who, while on an interstellar mining mission, discovers the body of an alien wearing a green ring, and upon examining it, is attacked by a fleet of robots known as the Manhunters. After fleeing with the ring, Hal journeys throughout space to learn the truth behind his new power, discovering that the Green Lantern Corps were once the universe's main peacekeepers until they were killed by their creators, the Guardians. 
After being kidnapped by the Manhunters, Hal leads a slave revolt on Oa and confronts the last surviving Guardian before finding the central power battery and using it to restore his ring to its full power. As the first of a new wave of Lanterns, Hal's mission to maintain peace across the cosmos bring him into conflicts with various foes, from Manhunters to an army of Yellow Lanterns. Throughout the book's story, several familiar characters are introduced. Kilowog serves as Hal's closest ally in Volume 1, while both Sinestro and Jon Stewart are introduced in Volume 2, with the latter following in Hal's footsteps after he's trapped in an alternate universe. This series is a radical reinvention of the Green Lantern mythos, and one of the most intriguing comics that I've read in the past few years. Both volumes are genuinely tremendous, blending the classic status quo of the Lantern Corps with a sci-fi horror tone reminiscent of films like Alien and 2001. Although the Lantern show has been confirmed to be Earth-based and will likely be set in present day to connect within the larger DC universe, I think the Earth-1 comics offer a lot of exciting avenues to reimagine Hal and John as characters. I would expect that some of the visual styles and characterizations from these comics will be adapted into the show, in tandem with the seminal Green Lantern run by Jeff Johns, which defined much of the team's modern history and lore in the years following Hal Jordan's resurrection. It's also worth noting that Hal's ascendancy to become becoming a superhero is a significant part of the New Frontier comic, so it's certainly possible that whatever mystery he and Jon Stewart might be investigating in their series could possibly be connected to Creature Commandos and a plot that would eventually result in the formation of the Justice League. From one green hero to another, one of the more curious announcements made by Gunn and Safran was that of a Swamp Thing film, set to be directed by Logan filmmaker James Mangold. Swamp Thing is a character with a rich history of stories and an incredibly deep mythos, and to explain it in more detail, I asked Matt Draper to discuss the hero's significance and talk about the comic series that will likely inspire this upcoming movie, Alan Moore's 1984 series, The Saga of the Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing is one of DC Comics' most versatile and consistently deep characters, starring in a run of comics across the decades made by some of the greatest artists in the medium, and taking part in some of the most beloved comics in the publisher's history. And while Swamp Thing was created in 1971 by Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson, this muck-encrusted mockery of a man was redefined when Alan Moore took over the comic in 1984. Alongside artists including Steve Bissett and John Tuttleben, and under the trailblazing editor Karen Berger, Moore changed the core of Swamp Thing from a man turned into a monster to a monster who only thought that he was once the dead Dr. Alec Holland. This identity crisis within the classic story of the anatomy lesson unlocked years of comics that took Swamp Thing from the bayou to hell to Gotham to the furthest reaches of outer space. And along the way, Swamp Thing and Abby Holland's love blossomed, giving DC Comics its most unconventional romance and making them the targets of a hateful mob. And despite its setting in the DC Universe, Swamp Thing's comics are not superhero tales. They're a mix of horror, sci-fi, romance, and the supernatural that blend together in a decades-long story of self-actualization. The saga of the Swamp Thing is truly Alan Moore's magnum opus for DC, having a breadth and depth unmatched by even his game-changing Watchmen. In the decades that followed, Swamp Thing's story was continued and reshaped by a cavalcade of writers, but they all owe a debt to Moore's vision. And this is why it's almost a guarantee that any DCU Swamp Thing film will largely take from Moore's time on the title. Whether it's an origin that combines the anatomy lesson with Wien and Wrightson's debut, or a later story that blends Americana with flesh-ripping terror, like the unpredictable American Gothic, which commented on then socioeconomic issues through a cavalcade of monsters. Personally, I think Swamp Thing and Abby and Gotham, fighting social norms and bringing the city and Batman to their knees, would make a bombastic but transgressive film that no one expects. Of course, Swamp Thing is no stranger to film and TV adaptations. For a character as niche as our Swampy Boy is, he's had quite a few shots at the mainstream with the terrible 1982 Wes Craven movie. The early 80s were tough for Wes, okay? Don't even get me started on The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. The even worse, Wes-less Return of Swamp Thing. The 1990 USA Network show that somehow had 72 episodes, a very short-lived animated series also from 1990, and a one-season live-action show from 2019 that 
was cancelled as soon as it premiered. Because if there's one thing that's consistent about DC and other media, it's that they're always a directionless mess. Yet despite so many adaptations, I don't think Swamp Thing is overexposed. No one is saying, oh, not another version of the time when Swamp Thing reconstitutes himself on an all-blue alien planet after having his consciousness severed from his elemental plant body, and then mourns his lost love for Abby again. And that's because all these interpretations have not really caught on with the mainstream audience, and none of them have really been able to capture the core of the character and his stories. Because for all its horror, all its madness, the story of Swamp Thing is a story of love, self-discovery, and finding your true place in the world. That's a challenge for anyone to completely capture, whether it's a comic, a TV show, or a movie. But when done right, it's unlike anything else offered by DC, and a thrilling break from the increasingly stale trend happening in superhero media right now. Swamp Thing broke boundaries in the 80s, with Moore and Berger famously rejecting the comics code authority to tell the stories they wanted to tell, and in the process, paving the way for Vertigo Comics. A modern Swamp Thing that breaks boundaries today could mean many more years of some of the most exciting stories possible in the DC Universe. When James Gunn and Peter Safran's plans to reboot DC were first announced, one of the main things people speculated on was the future of Batman. Initially, Ben Affleck had portrayed the Cape Crusader in 2016's Batman v Superman and 2017's Justice League, but had seemingly exited the role following the latter's troubled production. Plans for an Affleck-directed solo film, which would see the hero face off against Deathstroke, never materialised, and in its place, a new out-of-continuity Batman film was developed by Matt Reeves. Released in 2022, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson, Zoe Kravitz, and Paul Dano, was met with heavy critical acclaim. For me personally, The Batman is one of my all-time favourite comic book films, and one of my favourite takes on The Dark Knight outside of the printed page. However, although a sequel is set for release in in 2025, it won't be brought over into the new DC Universe. Instead, another version of the Dark Detective will be introduced in a film titled The Brave and the Bold. Taking its name from the popular comic series that ran from 1955 to 1983, this movie will not only introduce a new version of Bruce Wayne, but also his biological son Damien. So far, we know that Andy Machete, director of It and The Flash, is set to helm the film, while Gunn has spoken openly about drawing heavy influence from the work of acclaimed comic book writer Grant Morrison. Morrison's Batman run, which lasted from 2006 to 2011, begins with the storyline Batman and Son, which reveals the the existence of Damien as the child of Bruce and Talia al Ghul. At this point in his career, Bruce is a seasoned crime fighter with years of experience, having amassed a large rogues gallery and an equally sized roster of allies in the Bat family. However, fatherhood is something the hero is not prepared for, especially when Damien exhibits murderous tendencies owed to his training with the League of Assassins. Bruce and Damien's journey to bond with one another, both as father and son and as crime-fighting partners, made for a fascinating throughline throughout much of Morrison's Batman comics. This run pushed the Cape Crusader into uncharted territory, and made for an interesting examination of legacy through the perspective of this gothic superhero. Interestingly, much of the promotional art used by Gunn to discuss Brave and the Bold has not actually been taken from the Batman and Son arc, instead from the subsequent Batman and Robin series that began in 2009, and saw Damien fight alongside Dick Grayson, who adopted the mantle of Batman after Bruce's apparent death in Final Crisis. Now, I don't anticipate Dick to replace Bruce's Batman in this film, but it wouldn't shock me if Nightwing played a role in Brave and the Bold, possibly alongside other members of the Bat family like Barbara Gordon and Jason Todd. I think including a wider cast of characters would help differentiate this film from Reeves and Pattinson's series, as would focusing on the more fantastical and supernatural aspects of the Batman mythos. Although James Gunn recently noted that Brave and the Bold is still very early in development, I think a good way to go would be including characters like Raish and Talia al Ghul, Man Bat, and other superpowered foes that would be less likely to appear in any of the Matt Reeves Batman projects. And if they do intend to closely adapt Morrison's celebrated run, we could even see stories like the surreal and postmodern R.I.P., the James Bond-inspired Batman Incorporated, or even potentially Battle for the Cowl, and Dick Grayson's time as the Dark Knight at a later date. 
Even though I initially expected that Robert Pattinson would be the Batman of this new universe, I think adapting this particular era of Batman comics opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for Gunn, Saffron and Machete. And if the movie turns out to be anywhere near as good as the comics that inspire it, I believe that Brave and the Bold could turn out to be our most unique and distinctive Batman movie yet. But before we continue, I just want to take a minute to talk to you about Binary C, an exciting new comic produced by Graham Blackaby, best known on YouTube as Captain Midnight. The comic is currently being crowdfunded on Zoop, and Graham recently sent me the first issue to read. Honestly, I thought it was fantastic. Binary C details the supernatural story of a group of pirates aboard the HMS Pontus, who encounter unspeakable threats where sailors least expect them. From the opening page, it feels like such a lived-in world with a compelling mystery. Along with an intriguing set of characters and a real sense of tension that builds as the issue unfolds. The artwork immediately wowed me too, with Jason Pipperberg's pencils and Luke Romano's colouring making the comic look absolutely tremendous. For just $2, you can purchase the first issue of Binary C, and if you want to support the crowdfunding campaign, there's a huge list of perks and rewards, from variant covers inspired by Amazing Fantasy 15 to your own hour-long consultation with Captain Midnight himself, perfect for any aspiring comic or video creators. If you want to support the campaign or get more info, click the link in the video description or go to zoop.gg slash c slash binary c. Thank you to Binary C for sponsoring today's video. The next project I want to highlight in this video is Booster Gold, and to do so, I reached out to the biggest fan of the character that I personally know, my good friend Comic Drake. So I'm going to hand the video over to Drake, who will go over the history of Booster Gold, explain what comics might be adapted for his upcoming live action show, and why you should care and be excited for this often overlooked superhero. Booster Gold. His official tagline at DC Comics is, The greatest hero you've never heard of. And in case you're one of those people that's never heard of him, honestly, he's pretty simple. He's a scumbag from the future that goes back in time and decides to use all of his future knowledge to prevent crime before it happens and become a big sellout that puts his face on every kind of product imaginable. That's basically the entire plot of his original debut series, and this is likely what they're going to use as a blueprint for the new DC Universe. This series asks the question of what if a superhero acted like a real celebrity? He sets up Gold Star Incorporated as his own holding company to handle all of his brand deals, goes on dates with socialized and works to increase his rising star while also trying not to lose favor with the public. It's the perfect outline for episodic storytelling, and it's an interesting angle that mainstream superhero shows haven't really looked at for a main character. But if I'm gonna be honest, it's not really my favorite. It's actually this later series that made me fall in love with him because he is a time master. Over the course of his publication history, Booster grew as a character and became a much more competent hero. And as a time master, it's his job to help protect the time stream from those that would seek to abuse it. Remember Legends of Tomorrow? Yeah, this comic provided a significant amount of its inspiration. The best thing about this series, though, is that even though he's matured, Booster still needs to play the role of the self-centered airhead as a cover, since nobody in their right mind would suspect that this guy is actually the guardian of the time stream. Seriously, give either one of those a read if you're wanting to get involved with a character that I personally adore. One of the big questions surrounding this DC reboot is which characters from the previous series of films may reappear. While it's become clear in recent months that the entire Justice League looks set to be recast, two characters who seem to be sticking around are Peacemaker and Amanda Waller, with John Cena and Viola Davis both set to reprise their roles in future projects. It's currently unclear how this will be explained in-universe, but not only has Gunn stated that a follow-up season of Peacemaker will be worked on following Superman Legacy, but that a Waller miniseries is also set to air in 2024. The promotional images used to announce this show were taken from issue 39 of John Ostrander's acclaimed Suicide Squad run, and this could potentially point to what the premise of this show might be. Cover dated March 1990, Suicide Squad issue 39 acts as a prelude to the four-part storyline The Phoenix Gambit, which focuses on the reformation of Task Force X a year after it was disbanded due to Amanda Waller's arrest at the end of the Apocalypse Now story arc. After her release from prison, Waller reassembles the team outside of the jurisdiction of the US government, when tasked with a mission to prevent a confrontation between American and Soviet troops in the war-torn nation of Vlatava. Enlisting the 
likes of Captain Boomerang, Deadshot, Bronze Tiger and Poison Ivy, as well as forging an uneasy alliance with Batman, the squad heads to Europe to prevent the Cold War from escalating in its dying days. The Phoenix Gambit is a classic Ostrander Suicide Squad story, and the writers attempts to rebuild the ensemble following the events of the Janus Directive and Apocalypse Now storylines. And I think this soft reintroduction to the world of Amanda Waller could be a smart way of bringing the character back in the new DC Universe. It's been stated that this series, which is being developed by Jeremy Carver and Crystal Henry, will follow on from the events of Peacemaker, which saw the existence of the Suicide Squad being leaked to the world, so it's definitely plausible that this show may detail Waller's trial and potential arrest, and could even lead to the reformation of the squad at a later date. Alongside this, I wouldn't be shocked if a version of Checkmate was introduced into the DCU, and Waller could certainly be an avenue to do this. First appearing in Action Comics issue 598 from Marvel, March of 1988, Checkmate is a United Nations task force that monitors superhuman activity across the globe, and similar to the Suicide Squad, recruits heroes to perform covert missions, often to prevent international incidents. Although the modern iteration of Checkmate, introduced by Greg Rucker and Jesus Saiz in 2006, has focused on them as a UN superhero team, the group was initially started by Amanda Waller as a parallel division to Task Force X, so it's certainly plausible that the events of the Waller show may result in either the reformation of the Suicide Squad in the new DC Universe, or the creation of Checkmate as their spiritual successors. One would assume that anyone attempting to build a DC Universe would place the company's trinity front and centre. While Batman and Superman are both set to debut in their own live action films, a somewhat unexpected project was announced by Gunn and Safran that will serve as our introduction to Wonder Woman. Unveiled in December 2022, Paradise Lost is an upcoming TV series airing on Max that will focus on the history of Themyscira and the Amazons. Describing the series as akin to Game of Thrones, Paradise Lost seems to be a period piece set years before Diana's journey to man's world, detailing the origins of Paradise Island and the society that Wonder Woman emerges from. This decision was likely influenced by the fact that a series of Wonder Woman films starring Gal Gadot and directed by Patty Jenkins have been released in recent years, and by retelling the hero's origin here, you can build over the course of the show to introducing a new version of Diana Prince. However, I think it's worth noting that even before Gunn and Safran's appointment as the heads of DC Studios, an Amazon-centric project had been in the works for some time. As far back as 2019, Patty Jenkins had spoken about wanting to develop a film focused around Paradise Island that would act as a bridge between Wonder Woman 84 and the third installment in the series. Jenkins had reportedly co-wrote an outline for this film alongside Jeff Johns soon after, and Connie Nielsen, who starred as Queen Hippolyta, announced that she would appear in it. Obviously, this film never materialised, as plans for both an Amazon film and Jenkins' Wonder Woman 3 were shelved following Gunn and Safran's appointments. In terms of comic inspirations for this upcoming show though, from the few details we know about Paradise Lost, it seems to be drawing from two specific sources. Phil Jimenez and George Perez's storyline of the same name from Wonder Woman Volume 2 issues 168 and 169, and Kelly Sue DeConnick's 2021 miniseries Wonder Woman Historia The Amazons. During Phil Jimenez's run on Wonder Woman, which ran from 2000 to 2003, the writer told a multi-part storyline about the fall and rise of Themyscira, beginning with the Gods of Gotham arc that ran through issues 164 to 167. Diana is forced away from the island to aid Batman and his allies in stopping the resurrection of several Greek gods. This story leads directly into Paradise Lost, which sees Wonder Woman return to the island, only to find it erupting in a civil war between the Amazons of Themyscira and the Barnum Idol. Now, this story is notable for its shocking ending, which sees both Wonder Woman and Hippolyta denounce their titles as princess and queen of the Amazons in an attempt to build a new, more representative society. The events of Paradise Lost also lead into a later story entitled Paradise Found, where Wonder Woman is gravely injured after a battle with the Justice League, one which leaves Themyscira in ruins. Faced with no other option, Hippolyta sacrifices herself to bring Diana back to life, and once fully healed, Wonder Woman works to rebuild the Amazon's home, now in the Bermuda Triangle. 
Although these stories do incorporate many key aspects of the Wonder Woman mythos, I don't actually expect Paradise Lost to feature Diana as a main character, with her more likely appearing as a child or only formally being shown as Wonder Woman at the very end. As such, while I think the politics and Civil War aspects of Jimenez's story could be used in the Paradise Lost show, I would expect that Kelly Sue DeConnick's Historia would be a more likely source of inspiration. Released as a three-part miniseries throughout 2021, Historia is a modern retelling of the the history of the Amazons, beginning with the creation of Paradise Island and detailing the wars fought to defend it across centuries, before culminating in the present day with Diana's formal introduction. Although this is a relatively new comic in terms of adaptations, James Gunn has spoken extensively about his fondness for DeConnick's reimagining of the Amazons, so it's fair to assume that this book, one centred around the mythology of Themyscira and the conflicts and divisions that emerge when building a society, would provide a solid roadmap for a Game of Thrones inspired series that would eventually culminate in the introduction of a brand new Wonder Woman who would then embark on her journey into the wider DC universe. On the subject of recently released comics being adapted into this new DC universe though, perhaps the greatest example of this is Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, a film that is set to adapt the acclaimed 2021 miniseries by Tom King and Bilkis Everly. Just this week, it was announced that actress and playwright Anna Nogueira had been hired to write the screenplay and bring this celebrated comic to life. And to explain its premise in more detail, I asked Patrick Willems to overview what exactly Woman of Tomorrow is, why James Gunn and Peter Safran might have been so keen to adapt it, and why this might actually be the most exciting DCU project currently announced. Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow is an eight-issue DC Comics miniseries written by Tom King, drawn by Bilkis Evely, with colors by Matt Lopez, and it is one of my favorite comics of the past, like, decade. If you have no experience with the character of Supergirl, this is a pretty perfect introduction since 90% of the characters are brand new, created just for this story. None of it is set on Earth, none of Supergirl's regular supporting cast show up other than Crypto the Superdog and, and Comet the Super Horse, and it is just generally totally disconnected from the rest of the DC Universe. The simplest pitch for this comic book is that it is True Grit in space. If you're not familiar with True Grit, whether the original book by Charles Portis or the original movie with John Wayne or the other movie by the Coen brothers, it's basically about a girl whose father is murdered, so she hires this crusty old cowboy to help her track the guy down and get revenge. And Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow has pretty much the exact same premise, except obviously it's set on a different planet in outer space, and instead of a crusty old cowboy, the girl hires Supergirl, who she finds getting drunk on her 21st birthday in an alien bar. The comic is about their journey through space on the hunt for this really bad dude named Krem of the Yellow Hills, and it manages to pull off this really beautiful thing in that it totally works as one complete story across the eight issues, basically a graphic novel, but also each issue functions as its own story, so you get the best of a graphic novel and single-issue comics at the same time. And those individual stories are great, with Supergirl and Ruthie, the girl who wants revenge, who is also the narrator, traveling to different alien planets and experiencing different alien cultures. One of my favorites is an issue where they end up stranded on this planet where the sun saps Supergirl's powers, and the planet is also full of horrifying, monstrous alien dinosaurs. So Ruthie has to protect Supergirl all day while she's like unconscious until the sun goes down and she gets her strength strength back. And in another issue, Ruthie learns about Supergirl's tragic backstory, where she experienced the destruction of Krypton as a teenager, not a baby like her cousin Superman. And so again, if you know nothing about Supergirl, this is a perfect intro, and I think that's a big part of why they chose this to make into a movie. So yes, it is technically a superhero story, where, you know, Supergirl punches aliens, but mostly it's this lovely, bittersweet, coming-of-age story about grief and revenge, and this is where I have to mention the art, because this is straight up one of the most beautiful-looking things mainstream comics have published this century. Evely's line work has a really organic quality, with delicate brushstrokes and 
odd, rough, pointy edges that really excel when illustrating motion and speed, as well as detailed alien landscapes. Like, just the way she draws hair is more interesting than most entire comics. She, along with Lopez's subtle, pastel-tinged colors, make this really stand out amongst a sea of superhero comics. If anything, my biggest concern with the film adaptation is that the artwork in the comic is so beautiful and so incredible that trying to recreate that in live action is a nearly impossible task. So, uh, best of luck to whoever ends up making the movie, but however the movie turns out, the comic will always be a masterpiece. So, by looking at each of these 10 announced projects for the new DC Universe, there are a couple of themes and recurring ideas throughout them. Firstly, it's clear that James Gunn and Peter Safran are keen to put the previous era of DC films behind them, and distance this new series from any previous cinematic endeavours. Although a small handful of characters look set to return in some capacity, the vast majority of heroes and villains that will appear in these upcoming projects will be portrayed by all new actors, with no references to either the DC Extended Universe or any earlier live-action films. By offering that clean slate, by the time that Superman Legacy releases in July 2025, audiences will have had time to process the end of the old series of movies, following Aquaman 2's release this December, with Joker Folle Ado being the only release in 2024, and that film being clearly labelled as an Elseworlds project. Alongside processing that the series of films which began with 2013's Man of Steel is officially over, this separation will enable people to learn about and grow excited for DC's future, with production on the likes of Supergirl, The Authority and Lanterns likely set to begin in 2024 and 2025, meaning that in addition to building up to meeting our new Superman, tons of info will be made available about these other exciting corners of this fledgling universe. Perhaps the most striking thing about these projects announced so far though, and the way in which Gunn and Safran are promoting them, is their dedication to seemingly adapting specific comic book runs. Superhero movies have always cherry-picked plots and elements from a variety of comic book stories. Even movies borrowing the titles of well-known comics are often hardly faithful adaptations of the source material. And although it's too early to say for sure, the fact that projects like Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, Brave and the Bold and The Authority have undeniable sources of inspiration and have been marketed using images from the particular books that they're drawing influence from is a very positive and encouraging sign. My hope is that this approach will lead to not only more faithful adaptations of some of DC's best ever comics, but also a bigger emphasis being placed on encouraging moviegoers and film fans to engage with the source material, even though I do think it's a shame to lose several of the actors and characters from the previous era of DC projects, overall it's hard to argue that such a drastic restart wasn't necessary. Although the DCEU is the ninth highest grossing film franchise in history, eight of its 14 theatrically released movies have failed to break even, and especially in recent years, audiences seem to have lost faith in the DC brand. Even films that I particularly enjoyed, such as Blue Beetle, Shazam and The Suicide Squad, were hardly box office successes, and in order to win back the general audience, the company has to rebuild and provide a clear distinction between the previous era of films and this new universe that's coming in the next few years. As someone who grew up on DC Comics and loves so many of these characters and stories, I genuinely hope that the DCU and this first Gods of Monsters chapter will be a successful reintroduction to the company's universe and remind audiences of how brilliant and awe-inspiring so many of their characters are. I've always been a big fan of James Gunn as a storyteller and a filmmaker. In my opinion, his Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy are some of the absolute highlights of the MCU, and both of his DC works so far, The Suicide Squad and Peacemaker, have been amongst my favourites released by the company in recent years. It's obvious that Gunn is a talented writer, director, and someone with a deep love of comics and superheroes, and I sincerely hope that, along with Peter Safran and the other talented writers and visionaries around them, that they're able to bring DC back to the height of popularity popular culture. But as we anxiously wait for this new universe to begin over the next two years, there's an abundance of amazing stories out there on the printed page, and they will seemingly light the way for this exciting new beginning of the DC Universe.
Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. And if you enjoyed this and you want some more, there should be some other videos on screen right now that you might also enjoy. I wanna give a big special thanks to everyone who collaborated and helped out on this video. I really appreciate all of their contributions. Thank you to Matt Draper, Comic Drake, Patrick Willems, and Nando V Movies. I will leave links to their channels and their socials in the description. So if you're not already following all of these fantastic creators, please do go and show your support. If you want to help support this channel though, you can go to patreon.com slash owenlikescomics, or if you just want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter, just at owenlikescomics. But that's all for this video. Again, thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and hopefully I will see you next time. But until then, take care and keep reading.